name is Michael Delaney. For those who don't know me, I serve with my friend and distinguished colleague, Ovid Lamontagne, as co-chair of the Campaign for Legal Services. And as you know, the campaign works to expand access to justice throughout New Hampshire. Welcome to this virtual conversation with our Chief Justice, Gordon McDonald, about improving access to justice. And it really should be no surprise to any of us that the Chief Justice has selected this topic, one he has championed throughout his professional career, for his first public remarks and appearance as leader of our judicial system in New Hampshire. Many of you are likely aware that the Chief Justice served as our chair of the Campaign for Legal Services for three years when he was in private practice. He is a past recipient of the John E. Tobin Jr. Justice Award for his steadfast support of civil legal aid. And we are so fortunate to have a conversation with him today. The campaign recognizes and thanks the many supporters of this cause who have joined us today, including loyal donors of the campaign, tireless legal professionals at New Hampshire Legal Assistance, LARC, New Hampshire Pro Bono Program, who carry out this most difficult work each day, our business leaders and attorneys who care about access to justice, advocates and partners of other nonprofit organizations advancing justice goals in our court system, and certainly members of the public and media who care deeply about these issues. Thank you all for being with us for this hour. And as we welcome the Chief Justice, let's just pause for a second and refocus ourselves for this important conversation. Why do we gather today? Why do we do this? In America, we believe that all people have equal standing before the law. And as attorneys and business leaders, we know that access to the court system is greatly enhanced when all individuals are guided, advised, and represented by trained legal professionals. But far too often, only one side to a civil dispute, be it an eviction or a divorce, can really afford to hire an attorney for help. Civil legal aid provides free legal help so that people suffering economic hardship can have a trusted voice in our justice system to help those in need avoid homelessness, maintain their livelihoods, and protect themselves and their families from abuse. Approving and improving access to justice is a continuous challenge that we must work together on and meet head on. And we are so fortunate to have our Chief Justice, who understands this issue, who has done this work time and time again, focusing his pro bono work on Dove cases, founding Nixon Peabody's domestic protection team when he was in private practice, raising money for this cause, and who now, as our Chief Justice, will bring meaningful leadership to the judicial branch to advance access to justice for all. Chief Justice McDonald, thank you for speaking to us today and the virtual podium is yours. Thank you very much, Mike, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, Mike, thank you for that very, very kind uh, introduction. Uh, we do seem to have a pattern of following each other around. Uh, you were taking on a role that I once had and I just left the role that you discharged with uh, uh, such distinction. Uh, I want to say that it's taking on uh, the leadership role of the campaign uh, in the Leadership Council. You had some big shoes to fill. You are, you are absolutely up to it, but I note the presence of your co-chair, uh, Ovid Lamontagne, who's been really just a tireless champion for this cause for many, many years. And I thank you for your efforts, Ovid. And I know you served with another great co-chair, uh, uh, Erica Bodwell, uh, who was equally um, as energetic, enthusiastic, and and uh, committed to this cause, and it's just so gratifying to see where the campaign has uh, gone over the last four years since um, 
since I transitioned off to be um, attorney general. Uh, that the success of the campaign, uh, which I have noted with great pleasure and pride is uh, measured not just in the dollars raised, which is very, very impressive, uh, but the growing engagement of uh, both among members of both our profession, but also our broader community and particularly the business community. And I, I noted the current roster, the Leadership Council includes a number of business leaders and I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled to see that really, really important because as uh, Mike alluded and, and we'll discuss, this is a broad problem that, that um, requires all of us to work together. I do wanna commend um, with, with respect to the campaign success, um, all of those who have been involved, um, the boards of directors of the two and executive leadership of the two uh, component organizations, members of the leadership council, some of whom were on when I got off in 2017 and uh, uh, the co-chairs, as I mentioned, and of course, Sarah Palamaro, who is uh, an extraordinary asset to us all. Today, we're talking about uh, how we can improve access to justice. And, and I wanna pivot off of what Mike said and begin with why improving access to justice is so important. Let me discuss three, three reasons. First, and most importantly, because of the individual lives that can be touched and the lives that can be improved. As Mike said, my involvement in this issue began as a volunteer attorney for the Bar Association's domestic violence program. And uh, along with other volunteers, our, our, our work was to go into court and work with survivors of domestic violence and help secure protection for themselves and, and their children. And um, these, as I have said many times publicly, these are among the most meaningful cases I've had in my legal career. And invariably, uh, I would receive a thank you note from my client saying something to the effect of, thank you for being there to help me and my family and my kids. I could not have done this without you. Walking into a court, even for lawyers, can be a really intimidating, nerve wracking situation. But imagine it, walking into court where your rights, your safety, the safety of your kids is on the line. And unfortunately, uh, this happens um, far too often. The, percentage of domestic violence plaintiffs, those seeking a domestic violence petition in our circuit court who are self-represented is 88%. 97% of defendants in landlord tenant cases are self-represented. 95% of defendants in small claims matters are self-represented. So an issue in these cases our basic rights in matters of great importance to the parties, safety, security, access to healthcare and benefits that they have earned. So we touch individual lives and we improve them. But second, we honor the basic founding principles of our country our democracy, our civil liberties, our economic system all rest on the rule of law. And the rule of law is eroded and its promise of equal justice is diminished when so many among us cannot afford a lawyer to secure these basic rights and human needs. But aside from these two very important points, expanding access to civil legal services promotes other worthy outcomes. 
when individuals are able to resolve legal disputes, their families and communities are strengthened. When employees are able to resolve legal disputes, their employers benefit. When legal aid dollars are leveraged to expand representation, economies are achieved. And when lawyers represent clients in need, their skills and their professional lives are enhanced. As has been repeatedly noted at campaign events over the years, this, this cause transcends political ideology, judicial philosophy. Two of my favorite quotes are first from Judge Learned Hand, who spoke at the 75, the legendary uh, judge of the United States uh, Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, who spoke at the 75th anniversary of the New York Legal Aid Society and said, quote, if we are to keep our democracy, there must be one commitment, thou shall not ration justice. In 2014, Justice Scalia spoke to the 40th at, a, at an event marking the 40th anniversary of the Legal Services Corporation. He said, he asked, can there be justice if it is not equal? Can there be a just society when some do not have justice? And he answered, equality, equal treatment is perhaps the most fundamental element of justice. In, today, in today's law-ridden society, denial of access to professional legal assistance is denial of equal justice. So that's why this is important. And I uh, am happy to report uh, some really significant material progress in our state on expanding access to justice over and above the success of our campaign. And I wanna to touch on three, uh, four areas that I think bear noting uh, because they do serve as a foundation for the road ahead. The first um, is um, this civil needs, legal needs assessment uh, that was uh, completed at the end of last year and was released er earlier this year. It's a really important product. Uh, people should take the time to read it. It was the result of a professional, uh, professionally developed methodology, reaching out and, and uh, surveying and doing focus groups uh, of people in our state. Uh, and it provides really important data points for uh, everyone involved in this issue including the Supreme Court elected officials and the public at large. And it was all conducted in the middle of, uh, of a pandemic last year. And I do want to acknowledge uh, there, there were many hands involved, but uh, Sarah Madsen Dustin, um, executive director of NHLA was a leading force and it's a very, very important document. That's number one. Number two, is the impl implementation in New Hampshire of uh, something sponsored by the American Bar Association. It's called Free Legal Answers. And although it wasn't designed for a pandemic, it perfectly suits a pandemic by providing a platform for lawyers to deliver pro bono services in what is in effect a virtual legal clinic. And to me, um, having spent a long time um, trying to figure out how we can encourage more of our colleagues in the bar to take advantage of pro bono opportunities. This is a really exciting development. Um, we've got 97 lawyers signed up to do this in New Hampshire, and there is an enormous potential for growth in that. Um, the third, development is something called the Court Navigator Pilot Program. And this arose out of uh, work by the Supreme Court's Access to Justice uh, Commission in their survey of um, meaningful and uh, uh, beneficial um, innovations in other states. And, and one of those innovations adopted in a number of states are court navigator programs. And the, the proposal is 
presented to the Supreme Court and ultimately approved by the Supreme Court last year was to set up a pilot program um, where uh, we would hire a, um, a director and a, tr and a lawyer and leverage those two to train lawyers to assist uh, litigants uh, in our circuit courts with respect to the landlord tenant docket. It's a very challenging docket. It is, um, it is statute driven and, uh, and for self-represented parties. And I said, as I said, the overwhelming majority of parties in our landlord tenant uh, docket in circuit court district division are self-represented. The, the idea is to provide attorney assistance, volunteer assistance to help these litigants navigate, literally navigate uh, those cases. The, the proposal uh, matured into a recommendation uh, contained in the judicial branch budget request. And um, one of my very first duties, uh, having become chief justice, was to present the judicial branch's budget request uh, to the House when uh, the budget was in the House phase. And, um, and I was so pleased to be able to advocate for these two uh, court navigator positions in the state budget. It, it, uh, it continues to be in the state budget as, as it came over from the House. And tomorrow I'll be presenting to the Senate uh, on, on that and other access to justice um, proposals, which I'll discuss a little bit later. Uh, fourth, I was again, really pleased um, to see that lots of hard work over many years has resulted in the pending merger of LARC and the pro bono program. And I think this will achieve not only efficiencies, but really great synergies and collaboration. Uh, and I commend again, the boards of those two organizations and their executive leadership. And, and Brecky is with us today on the panel. Thank you for all your work, Brecky. So what is the road ahead? Well, these, these developments are, uh, are really important. And as I said, I think they, they are material and they provide a lot of momentum to build on. So how do we take advantage of that? First, in my view, uh, I, I believe there should be a sustained focus on the importance of, importance of this issue at the Supreme Court level. In 20, uh, 2007, uh, the Supreme Court under the leadership of Chief, uh, then Chief Justice Broderick, another former chair of the Campaign's Leadership Council, created the access in Access to Justice Commission. And it's charged with advising the Supreme Court on access to justice initiatives. Um, and along with this campaign, I also served on that body uh, prior to becoming attorney general. I, I was, was pleased to be able to meet with them the, for the first time earlier this week. And I'll tell you what I said. The civil access to justice problem is big and it's complex. And therefore we need to think big. I charge them with being an incubator on ideas and proposals, a think tank, if you will, for the Supreme Court in bringing forward meaningful um, proposals to help us institutionally better ad address the access to justice issue. I said that um, I can't guarantee the court will approve everything that gets brought forward, but you will have a very receptive audience uh, in me and other members of the court. Um, we, we as lawyers all serve the public and that service must include meaningfully addressing the access to justice gap. I've asked uh, my colleague, uh, Associate Justice Jim Bassett, uh, to take on the role of co-chairing that uh, commission. And, um, and that signals the importance I place on it uh, in terms of being a direct, uh, having a direct voice with the Supreme Court on ideas and proposals and, and uh, 
innovations that we can implement here in the state. None of this occur, occurs in a vacuum. One of the great benefits of a federal system is you have 50 states experimenting and, and um, implementing different ideas. And as, as I said, the Navigator program came from many states which had, had adopted it. And there are other ideas out there that we need to, we need to be thinking about and looking at. Two immediate issues that I asked the commission to look at is how we can do better uh, with respect to encouraging members of the bar to do pro bono work. And the second is to take advantage of the demographic in our profession where, where lots of our baby boomer colleagues are moving on to retirement and how we can support them in leveraging their expertise, their career long, uh, career long developed experience to establish a fellows program to assist um, a clients in need uh, and, and what, what we can put together uh, and what changes may be needed to support such a program. Again, this is an idea that's been adopted in other states. Um, I will, as I said, also be advocating for the judicial branch budget uh, and we'll be appearing before the Senate Finance Committee tomorrow. As I said, it has important access to justice features in it, including the Navigator program I discussed. We're also advocating for additional justice judges in the circuit court, uh, which is uh, paramount to expanding access to justice. The circuit court is authorized to have 45 judges. Right now, our census is about 35. Um, and um, the workload, uh, the, the data, establishes that the workload before that court uh, would support fully funding 45 judges. We're asking for an additional two new circuit court judges. Um, and I believe this is especially important as we emerge from, from the pandemic and that court with very, a, an extremely busy docket and a very high number of self-represented litigants across its various subject matters needs the additional resources. Um, next, I, and the reason I am here is I want to take advantage of opportunities to discuss the importance of access to the civil justice system. And I, I want to encourage a, a conversation that is as broad as possible, not just lawyers, but um, members of uh, the, business community, elected officials, community leaders to, to educate and, and uh, sensitize um, the people in our state about just how important this issue is. And finally, uh, I want to make clear that an important part of the access to justice um, solution moving forward is the continued vitality of organizations such as New Hampshire Legal Assistance and the Legal Advice and Referral Center, the two beneficiaries of the campaign. Uh, they are and will remain essential components in addressing the access to justice gap. And that is why this campaign is so important and uh, why I am pleased to be able to be with you um, uh, on, as Mike said, my, my first real public encounter. So thank you very much. Chief Justice, thank you very much. Your, your description of the magnitude of, of the self-representation challenges um, uh, is insightful. And, and to have that coupled with your vision of, of um, court committees serving as think tanks and incubators moving forward um, I, I think has a lot to do with why uh, we have so many in attendance today. So we look forward um, to participating in a question and answer session with you uh, as, as this hour progresses. Before we do that, uh, I'd like to turn the mic over to Sarah Masson Dustin, Dustin, the Executive Director of New Hampshire um, Legal Assistance, to talk a little bit about um, how things are in the field right now, how civil legal aid is working right now, how it's interacting with the courts, 
um, and and what what you're what you're experiencing um, from your seat leading leading this effort at NHLA. Sarah, thanks so much. Thank you, Mike, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with all of you, and especially to be joined by Chief Justice McDonald and to hear his vision for access to justice in New Hampshire. Uh, I'm familiar with the data around self-represented litigants. And yet every time I hear it, I am still staggered uh, by the, the size of the challenge that is confronting all of us who are working in the civil legal system, whether it's as, um, as attorneys in private practice, as legal aid advocates, as judges and court staff, um, it's going to take all of us working together uh, to make inroads in making the system work better for everyone. So my job this afternoon is to tell you a little bit about what we do at NHLA and LARC and about our client community. Uh, Brecky is going to talk a little bit about what the experience of the programs has been uh, during the pandemic. So our focus at the Legal Advice and Referral Center and at NHLA is on helping people who are experiencing economic hardship with civil legal issues that impact their most basic human needs. We have financial eligibility guidelines and I just wanted to tell you what those are so you can have context for um, the client community that we're working with at the legal aid programs. Our guidelines allow us to help people with household incomes up to 200% of the federal poverty level. So that's about $26,000 per year for a single person, about $53,000 per year for a family of four. But most of our clients, are actually experiencing considerably deeper poverty when they come to legal aid looking for help with a civil legal issue. So for example, in 2020, 59% of NHLA's clients had income below 100% of the federal poverty level, which is just $13,000 per year for a single person or $27,000 per year for a family of four. The majority of our legal aid clients are women. That's true in New Hampshire as it is true around uh, around the entire country. Nearly half of our clients report experiencing a disability and we help clients with issues both related to their disability and with legal issues that people with disabilities experience at higher rates than people without disabilities. Our focus on basic means means that we're working alongside our clients to preserve their housing by helping people to defend eviction cases or to preserve a housing subsidy like a Section 8 voucher. We're helping our clients access benefits like unemployment insurance, food stamps, Medicaid. And we're helping to ensure that our clients can achieve safety from abuse by helping them access domestic violence protective orders and other family law relief like child support, divorce, custody orders. These are the building blocks of safety and stability for our clients. They are the uh, tools that help people to achieve uh, lives that can provide security for themselves, both economic security and other kinds of security, um, and to provide that for other family members, for children, for older uh, relatives that are living in the household. Between LARC and NHLA, we're able to offer the full spectrum of legal help, ranging from pamphlets that can help people to understand their rights and how certain court processes work. We know that that kind of legal information is incredibly important in a world in which most people will indeed go on to represent themselves. And our services range all the way up to litigation in all of New Hampshire's state and federal courts. Between NHLA and LARC, we have 26 attorneys and 10 paralegal advocates. Our paralegal advocates are handling administrative law cases. So they might be helping someone with a Medicaid appeal or helping someone with a Section 8 voucher hearing. We also have a fantastic team of people who focus on screening and intake. We field several thousand calls per year, which is an extremely high call volume. And so we have people who are able to quickly refer folks to the public defender or to 211 or to say, yes, you're calling us about an issue with which legal aid can help. We're gonna do an intake and see if we can get you the help that you need. Both LARC and NHLA have conquered offices. And before the end of the year, we hope that we will be located together in the same building, which will be um, the fulfillment of a goal that we've had for a very long time. So we're really excited about that. NHLA also has offices in Berlin, in Claremont, in Manchester, and in Portsmouth. Uh, so we are a statewide program. We have a, a great team of really dedicated people, but we still have a huge gap 
between what we're able to provide and the need that exists in our client community. Every year we turn away several hundred people, not because they have legal issues that we don't work on, not because they uh, aren't eligible for our services, but because we simply don't have enough hands to do the work. So those are our folks that we're turning away even though we could help them. And even though we think that our help would allow them to achieve a better resolution in the case. Uh, we're, we're really uh, pleased to partner very, very closely with the pro bono program and are really enthusiastic about in a few short months being two programs instead of three. Um, with every day we are working towards the goal of having a system that is as unified and as understandable as possible so that clients are able to quickly um, find out where they can get help and quickly get to the source of help that is ultimately uh, going to be appropriate for them, whether that's placement with a pro bono attorney or with an NHLA attorney or getting some information from um, our great website, which is chock full of information. Um, and we're, we're really looking forward to this next stage of, of legal aid in New Hampshire. So that's a little bit about what we do. And I'm going to hand it back over to Mike. Thank you. Sarah, thanks so much. Um, Chief Justice McDonald recognized and alluded to the fact that Brecky Hayes Snow uh, has had a, a very busy year um, uh, transitioning from the three program to two program model. But that's actually not why she had a really busy year. That was only part of it because Brecky really is on the very front lines of hearing from those when they initially reach out and, and just need help. Um, Brecky, can you tell us a little bit about what your organization is seeing right now and particularly how, how the pandemic has informed your view of the work? Sure, I'm happy to. And I also wanna just take a brief moment to thank uh, both the Chief Justice and the, the co-chairs of our Campaign Council for, for being here and participating in this process and to Sarah for speaking so eloquently about legal services in New Hampshire and, and what we do. Um, as was mentioned, LARC sits uh, very much on the front lines with our call center and our online application for legal services. We field um, an average of 5,000 applications uh, for assistance every year. Um, and, you know, I think of 2020 as having been a year of extremes. Um, while there were certain issues that sort of fell off of everybody's radar, um, there were others that were, were new and, and really changed the landscape for us. Um, in terms of just applications for assistance, uh, even there we see extremes. Uh, in the first part of 2020, we saw the applications for assistance drop off about just over 25%, um, which was you know, a significant number. And then within about three months, we were back at about 35% above average. Um, without changes in staffing, we saw this, this incredible swing. And in 2020, LARC managed more applications than in any year for the past five or six years. Um, our overall applications for assistance remain fairly constant in terms of between 70 and 80% are housing and family cases. And that has been consistent for years. What we saw in 2020 that was really remarkable was the increase in unemployment applications. Um, it's probably not a surprise, um, but it was remarkable going from an average of about 19 unemployment uh, applications a year to over 220 in 2020 and over 150 just thus far this year, uh, we see this as a significant problem. We also are continuing to anticipate a significant uh, increase in housing applications uh, when, when the, the various moratoria on evictions are lifted. Uh, that's one area that that we have been prepping for and prepping for and prepping for um, and have no idea exactly what we will see when that happens. But our staff and the staff at New Hampshire Legal Assistance continue to stay abreast of every change in the law and practice 
in the hope that when that does happen, we will be in the best possible position to help our clients uh, avoid homelessness, which has always remained one of our primary objectives. Um, so that's what we have seen primarily. Um, the demand for services has increased steadily since the beginning of the pandemic, um, since the original decrease when I think nobody quite knew what to make of the pandemic in, in March and April of last year. Um, so we appreciate the support of the campaign. We appreciate the support of our partner at New Hampshire, partners at New Hampshire Legal Assistance. Um, and we look forward to a, a more streamlined and uh, efficient legal services program statewide once Lark and Pro Bono have completed the anticipated merger. So I'll hand it back to Mike. Thanks very much. Brecky and Sarah, thanks so much for everything that you do and, and more importantly for everything that the legal professionals working with you do uh, to support your leadership of these organizations. We've reached the portion of our program where we'd like to advance a broader dialogue um, with you that is always challenging in a virtual world. And we've set up a format given um, our, our great attendance that hopefully will allow us to best manage that. I'm going to encourage Sarah Palermo to either supplement and or correct my instructions on this to the extent I get them wrong. But we're going to invite you to pose questions to our panelists through the Zoom Q&A function. And if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see several icons, one which is labeled Q&A. Please click on that if you have a question uh, and we'll present it to the panel. Feel free to direct it to, to any of the three panelists if you'd like. Uh, and if you'd like to ask it generally, we'll let the three of them um, fight over, over speaking time. Um, also feel free to reference if you'd prefer that question to be posed to the panelists with or without um, attribution. Um, I will get things started um, by posing a question uh, from uh, one of our champions to another of our champions. So this is a question from um, Tom Sidoric. Uh, that I will pose in the first instance to Chief Justice McDonald. Um, we should pause for a moment and wish Tom a very, very happy birthday. I can think of no better way to spend a birthday um, than to join the cause of access to justice um, with so many of your good friends. So happy birthday, Tom. And with that, um, I have a question for the Chief Justice. Given Chief Justice McDonald's experience as attorney general and in private practice, what unique perspective might he bring to the court? And how might that perspective help the courts function better in providing equal justice for all? First of all, happy birthday, Tom. <laughs> uh, thanks for the question. Uh, First of all, they were, I, I will say in terms of discuss in terms of access to justice issues here at the court, I have a very receptive audience and my four colleagues. Um, and the perspective I bring, I think is 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 really, as I said, I, in the first instance, having been a volunteer uh, attorney in private practice, um, uh, with the Bar Association's domestic violence program and having stood by um, survivors of domestic violence who are seeking the safety and security of a protective order. And, and having gone through that process and seen that process myself and, and having um, um, lived through a little bit through their lives about what it means and how, um, how meaningful it is and how um, life-changing it can be to have the safety and security of, of a domestic violence order like that, uh, it, it, the protection of a domestic violence order 
And, you know, I think it's always, as I tried to say in my remarks, it's always very important to ground whatever you're doing um, in the lives of individuals and, and, and look at policy decisions and look at things that we can change through, through how it will affect individuals' lives. And, and I guess that gets to being uh, my role as attorney general, and I'm sure Mike, you would agree with this, that uh, that, that role uh, in our legal system is absolutely unique in that um, a single individual has enormous opportunity to affect the lives of individuals in our state. I mean, that, that was the most um, profound thing I, I felt in holding that role. And again, you know, when I, when I tried to um, discern what the right thing to do as attorney general, I always I did my very, very best to think about the individual lives that would be touched by it. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Um, we have another question um, from Jean Stern. I will, I will um, pose this question in the first instance to Sarah and Brecky, and, and then uh, allow the Chief Justice to follow up because it may implicate information both within the court system and, and within the organizations um, uh, that serve those in need. Uh, and here is the question. Um, are there statistics about how people who represent themselves fair in the system? So that's a great question. <laughs> uh, and I'm sorry to say that I, I don't have an answer. Um, I'm, I don't know the degree to which that uh, data exists comparing the outcomes of cases for uh, people who have advocates versus the outcomes for people who don't. Um, there is um, some emerging data around the country uh, associated with a broader right to counsel movement. Um, so there are a number of jurisdictions that over the last several years have uh, adopted a right to counsel in eviction cases, for example. Um, these are sometimes municipal, I, I think at this point might be all municipal jurisdictions. Um, and, and that data is showing um, really significant success rates associated with people having attorneys in, in eviction cases. Um, what I, I think is, is really important to keep in mind uh, is that the, the programs currently do um, and almost certainly always will focus our efforts on the cases where legal intervention can actually make a difference. Um, so there are cases eviction cases among them, um, in which the involvement of an attorney might not be able to make a difference at all, or might be able to make a difference only in making um, the outcome perhaps more humane than it would be otherwise. So in other words, helping someone to exit from an apartment on a longer timeline than they might otherwise have to do so. Um, so I, I think that um, I really appreciate the question, Jane. I think we should put it on our list of data to um, investigate whether we can, uh, can look at that data the next time we're conducting a needs assessment, which will be very soon, I hope. Um, but I, I think anecdotally speaking and looking at this emerging data from around the country, we, we, we know for sure that lawyers um, do make a difference. Thank you. Are there any panelists that would like to follow up? I would just want to add one comment to what Sarah said, and I think it's a really important one when talking about outcomes. Um, there was a time when, when after the, the last um, housing crash that Lark had a very active um, foreclosure relief project in cooperation with NHLA and Pro Bono. And one of the things that we found with our clients that um, made a tremendous difference from their perspective was what we categorized as the graceful exit, which is what Sarah was alluding to. Um, and for a client, the difference between being locked out of their home and having the opportunity to make a choice and make a, a proactive move into some other housing 
was a, an incredible difference in their quality of life. Does none of those cases would show up as a quote unquote win um, in most outcomes studies, but for those clients, it was a tremendous benefit. So capturing outcomes for a lot of these cases is really hard to do because it's the objective counting of cases doesn't really um, give a good picture of the client's experience in the, the process. Yeah, I, I was gonna make a point similar to that. If there are data on this, I, I'm unaware of it. It's a very interesting and good question. Um, but I would say that uh, you would, to, to measure the benefits of having a lawyer involved sh surely should not be limited to just outcomes. It's, it's, it's the uh, benefits by standing by a client and her family as she is navigating a completely foreign process to try and get safety and security for herself and her family. I mean, there's just a benefit there that I'm not sure you could ever capture without regard to the outcome of the case. And, and again, you know, that those are the individual, it, it, it's the part of individual lives that we're trying to touch here with, with this effort. Mike, if I'm if I might add, um, uh, among all the legal aid organizations across the country, we're always talking a little bit about um, communication work that we're doing or or studies that have been done. And there was a relatively small study um, in New York City several years ago um, that developed um, upsetting and and revealing data. It's a small data point, but it's one that I, I think really um, illustrates very tangible effect of legal aid. Uh, in, in this study, they looked at protective order applications for victims of domestic violence. And uh, during the course of the study, they found that um, when they applied without representation or advice, 30% of survivors were successful in their application, um, but with advice and guidance from legal aid, either a paralegal or an attorney um, in coordination with the crisis center, that success rate was 80%. So it really shows um, the impact. As I said, it is a small data point. It's not from New Hampshire. And I know that we do want um, concrete data from New Hampshire, but um, I get incredibly moved thinking about what that data means on the ground for a, a survivor. That's an incredible statistic, Sarah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, let, let me pose um, this question to the panel, focusing on access to justice in a very practical way in terms of where we're at. And I'll try to personalize this a bit. You know, in the 27 years I've been practicing, um, our interaction with the court system has changed more dramatically in the past 12 months than it has in the first 26 years of my practice. Um, trained professionals, um, even me who, who, who isn't quite um, an old dog on uh, technology has been really challenging. The court system has adapted wonderfully. It was, it was a struggle at the beginning, it's gotten better, but I think for all the practitioners on, on the call. Um, it's a new world and there's a lot of questions about how quickly we may return um, to the old ways and, and how much of what we have right now may stay. Um, with those unknowns pending, how, how do we ensure real access um, for those in need in self-representation settings, um, in situations where they may have help um, from attorneys uh, that are volunteering their time but aren't as familiar uh, with the subject matter of the court system. How do we build access into justice into what 
what our contacts with the court have been during the past year and and how we move beyond the pandemic in a world where um, the, the way the way we present disputes for re resolution to the court may radically change. Uh, I'll defer in the first instance to Becky and Sarah about their experience on the ground. either helped or hurt access to justice. Sarah, you've stayed on mute. Uh, I lost the Chief Justice's audio for a second there, so I couldn't hear all of what <laughs> he said, but um, you no, know, I think that the uh, impact of the pandemic on our law practice has been surprising in a few different ways. Um, we had generally been somewhat, I think, resistant uh, or nervous about interacting with clients um, via tools like, like video conferencing, um, thinking that it really is difficult to develop an effective and trusting attorney-client relationship um, using those kinds of communication tools. And I think that we've learned that we weren't entirely right about that. And that although we do still have certain clients and certain kinds of interactions that really do need to happen in person, that there are other clients um, for whom not only does the video uh, conferencing work, but sometimes is a lot easier for their lives. If it means not having to find transportation, if it means not having to find childcare, if it means being able to, um, slip out on a break from work rather than needing to take time off, that um, this is actually a, a way of interacting that can be a lot easier for people. And I think that we, I'm sure that we did not fully appreciate um, the ways in which this could, um, could be more effective for our clients. Uh, the other thing that has really been a surprise is remote hearings have to a certain degree decouple the relationship between where our advocates are stationed and where their clients are or where the cases are. So for example, we could have an attorney uh, in Berlin working with a client in Nashua and doing a remote hearing um, in the circuit court in Nashua. And we've just saved um, probably multiple, several hour car trips, um, which is enough time to do another case or two. Um, so, you know, I think that we really have, uh, have come around that some of what we've learned to do during the pandemic is here to stay um, and is going to be a feature of our legal work going forward. Now, we still have to confront the problem of the digital divide. Um, there are clients who uh, don't know how to use all of these technologies, don't have the devices that they need, don't have the minutes available or are still living in places um, in parts of New Hampshire that, that, that don't have sufficient broadband access to make this really feasible for them. So um, it's incredibly important that we still allow the traditional access points of telephone um, and post-pandemic walk-in access. Um, but I, I think that we are going to be able to use some of these tools to, um, to expand our reach both geographically and in terms of the number of people um, that we can help with travel being um, somewhat less part of the equation. Uh, but we, we certainly know that um, the designing a, um, a court system that relies a lot on remote hearings for the long term is a very different project than um, stitching together one on an emergency basis, which I think the judicial branch has done just a, a remarkable job of responding to this challenge. Um, but we that we need to make sure that any system that's built for the long term is going to be able to accommodate the needs of people that don't have the requisite technology access or skills um, and um, for situations that may just simply be too complex to do um, over a video conferencing system. For example, a case that needs multiple simultaneous legal interpreters. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever done that before, um, but it is, uh, it, it is pretty close to impossible <laughs> to have um, multiple simultaneous legal interpretation happening 
um, in a way that uh, really allows everyone to understand the proceedings and be heard. So um, definitely some challenges in building the system for a long term, but I think this is a, an example of us um, having been shown through challenge uh, that, that we maybe should have been a little bit more open-minded about this. Great, and, and I'm gonna pose one last question and, and pose that question um, as a transition to my friend um, Ovid to extend our parting thanks to the Chief Justice uh, and perhaps a, a parting challenge um, uh, to our group. Uh, and with that, Ovid, uh, the floor is yours and I will tee it up with the following question from the chat. Are there funding barriers that contribute to the lack of access to justice? Ovid, you can close it out from here. Thanks very much. I assume the chief may have a comment or two to, to make about that question. About I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Ovid. Uh, I, I understand from the question that it's, it's a, there's a funding question, Mike, that, that you wanted the chief to uh, comment on. Um, I'll repose the question, which is, are there funding barriers that contribute to the lack of access to justice? <laughs> Would you like to answer that? Well, I, I think in the first instance, NHLA and LARC can speak firsthand to the need to f adequately fund their organizations and serve the clients in need. I, I, we heard some really startling statistics from uh, both Sarah and Brecky about the increase in demands and their inability to meet those the demands or there would be clients. Well, well, thank you for, for those comments and thank you for participating today, Chief Justice McDonald in our, our program. Um, your position uh, as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is an enormous one. And for those of us who support legal aid, and access to justice, it's heartening to know that among your highest priorities is helping to find ways to provide greater access to our citizens uh, who are in need, the poor, the underserved, or those that need services that the judicial system is equipped to offer, but so hard for some people to access. So we really are heartened by that. And in a special way, I wanna thank you for your willingness to let us record this program uh, so we can uplift the, uh, upload it to our website, circulate the link to some of our supporters who weren't able to participate today, and so that they have an opportunity to see and experience firsthand uh, how lucky we are to have a Chief Justice with your experience and your commitment to this really important issue. Uh, to maybe comment a little bit about uh, uh, Tom Sidoric, happy birthday, Tom, uh, mm -hmm. question. Your remarks really evoked, I think, for a lot of us who are practitioners, a real understanding about what it is to be before the court, to be participating in the civil justice system. The fear factor that you've identified is, is multiplied many times for lay people who come to court. And, and with proper representation, that fear factor can be ameliorated, uh, the complexities of the process itself but I think the thing that underscore that I took away more than anything else is your great sense of compassion for the citizens, the clients that you're working with as a lawyer. And, uh, and that is part of who we are as a profession. It's that counseling function. And so we're looking forward to continue to expand the opportunity for others to be compassionate in the same way. I, I think of the innovations you've also spoken about. And, and, it's, and it brought to mind something that happened in 1987. It was a simple legislative change made that enabled an organization called the Court Appointed Special Advocates to enlist the help of lay people who are properly trained to participate in the legal system on behalf of children who are abused and neglected. And I, ha I have to think that with your leadership, we'll find other opportunities to make statutory changes or regulatory changes that will expand the opportunity for court navigators and all to participate. So 
Thank you for that uh, innovative thinking and, and your um, leadership on that. Um, I, I want to remind our audience uh, that um, funding is acute and we are on the brink of a tsunami, we believe, uh, in the legal services world. So if you're able to help us, uh, I would invite you to visit our website, and that is New Hampshire nh-cls.org uh, to make a contribution. We were blessed last year, and your honor, to have a, the most successful campaign we've ever had in the midst of a pandemic. And that was due to the great professionals, uh, some of whom you've worked with, like Sarah Palermo, I call her Dr. Sarah, Sarah MD, uh, <laughs> Dustin, and Brecky and other professionals have helped us. It, it was amazing that we were able to do that. But the need is even greater now as we come out of this pandemic. So to the audience, I would ask you, please consider making a contribution today and join us on May 7th, if you're able, on May 6th, if you're able to do so, for our kickoff breakfast. The chief will be speaking to us a little bit there as well. And be an opportunity to network. And my final thought, the business community has a stake in this, in this, in this particular initiative. And that is a lot of employees, entry-level employees, um, people on the front lines of your business who have a legal problem are consumed by it. Help us help them have the legal services and legal representation they need that will help you. And so thank you all for joining us today to my co-chairman, co Michael Delaney. Well done, my friend. Well done. And Chief, thank you again for being with us.